Dallas has a great history in kind of Pentecostal charismatic history. <clears throat> I've been around to most of the places there. There's a few things that I've still got to find. But how many of you have heard a man named F.F. F. Bosworth? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's, uh, he, he wrote Christ the Healer. Um, his first church, his first full gospel church, was in Dallas. He left Zion, Illinois, and moved to Dallas and started that church there. Uh, I know where the church is, or I know where the building is. Uh, there's a wooden building there that is still standing that was that actual building. Uh, of course, Christ of the Nations are there. Gordon Lindsay, who traveled with Dr. Lake, is there. Mother Edder, Mariah Woodworth Edder, was uh, there in 1913, I think it was, 1910. Yeah, 1910. And or up into 1913, had one of the longest-running revivals in America up to that time. Uh, it lasted about 13 months, I think it was, total. Uh, stories of people coming in to be to the revival, riding trains in. One man died on his way in. He was sick, and he died before he got there. So on the trip over, they actually put his body into a mail bag, you know, the big bags they used to carry the mail in. And they put him in that and then closed it up. And when they got there in Dallas, they basically unloaded his body, and there were some people that were supposed to meet him there. And so they just delivered his body to him. And so they didn't know what to do, so they took the body over to the church where Mother Edder was having the revivals, and the platform was about six foot off the ground, and it was very hot, and so they decided to try to keep the body cool until they figured out what to do. So they put the body in the mail sack underneath the platform where it would be cool. And then that night she started preaching, and about halfway through her sermon, he came back from the dead. <laughs> and started crawling out from under that thing. <laughs> Sure, he looked like Houdini coming out of the mail sack and all that, but, but there, were, there were just amazing testimonies like that of what happened, and that was early Dallas. That's what went on. Um, Jack Coe was there. Jack Coe had his children's home there. His church, the Dallas Revival Center, was there. I mean, just a tremendous history. And Jack Coe, matter of fact, is buried just a, about a mile away from Christ the Nations. Uh, what, what I'm trying to do is get all these places pinpointed so that if you come down, we might even be able to just maybe get a bus or something and put everybody on and take a tour and go around and see all these places and talk about them and get you out there and rub on the wood so you can get the anointing. And all. <laughs> just, just, just kidding. Um, but get you to see it and, and kind of know the history there. So there's some neat things there. Uh, Dallas has a great history. So anyway, uh, if, we would love to have you down there. And if you are coming or if you would like to come, just be sure to go online and register. Okay, we need to know how many people are going to be there. So all right, let's get back into the Word. We had stopped at verse 14 of Romans chapter 8. Verse 15 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself, or himself, as we would say, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, you can read, and actually I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of this. I wasn't going to, but I do want to get to some per certain parts. And if children, verse 17... Then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Now notice, joint heirs with Christ. You're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Not a co-heir. You're not splitting everything. You're joint heirs. Right? That means you have everything he has. Which matches 1 John 4, 17. This says, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen? So you're going to see these things start backing each other up. Notice though... You are a joint heir. Whatever Jesus has, you have. Jesus has nothing that you don't have. Amen? And th don't, I hope you're hearing more than just the words I'm saying. Okay? I hope you hear the ramifications of this. What that means is, is very simple. That means that when you've been told, go here and get this anointing, this new fresh anointing, this new outpouring, this new impartation, or this whatever it is, Nothing's new to you. You've already got it. You understand? If Jesus has it, you have it. And if Jesus doesn't have it, you don't want it. Okay? So when some people start coming along with this anointing and that anointing and get this and this is new and this is... Forget that noise, all right? That is junk. And the whole thing is designed to keep you in bondage and never rising up and being who you're supposed to be recognize what you have and walk in what you have. Amen? You've got to get this. You're, you're there. You know? You're not trying to get there. You're there. 
Now the problem is just renew your mind and start acting like it. The fastest way to renew your mind is to start acting like it. See, now here's the thing. Right now you know it. Here you know about it. When you start doing it, it locks it in and that's when your mind is renewed. We have to be very specific in some of these definitions. You knowing about something is not your mind being renewed. Right? Your mind is not renewed because you know about it. Right now, you, you've been hearing some things that I've been saying the last couple of days. Now, you know them here in the Spirit. You know it. It's there. But you've been hearing them sometimes for the first time, and it's, you're hearing it here. So it's there. And I could get kind of scientific on it because I really enjoy this aspect. And I've been doing quite a bit of research. I'm actually putting together, as I said earlier in, in the earlier on, I don't believe it was God's intention that it take 30, 40 years for you to renew your mind. I believe that it should be much more instant. And so I've been looking at what the Bible says and how, what the Bible has told us to do of how to renew our mind and how to walk in that. And I'm putting it together in a program, is the best way to say it, so that it's a step-by-step -step thing that you can do to renew your mind faster than if you just sit in church and hear a message and read the Bible every now and then. So I'm putting that together, and it's really amazing because, as you probably well know, you have what's called short-term memory and long-term memory. Well, right now, what you're hearing is floating around in your short-term memory, right? Now, if you leave here and don't do something, that short-term memory will eventually dissipate, and you'll forget you even heard it. And when somebody talks about it, you'll kind of remember, oh yeah, I heard something about that, but you won't be able to recall it perfectly. Now, but if the way to lock it in, you need an anchor. Right now it's floating around. You need something to anchor it so that it goes in and becomes long-term memory, and then you can actually start living by it. And the way that that happens, one of the anchors of long-term memory going from short-term to long-term is action. And you have to tie an action to the memory, that, and that will make it long-term. Now, how fast that happens is dependent upon the amount of emotion or attention that you have for it. And even with the attention, we could even say intensity. So, the way for you to renew your mind faster, first off, is to hear it, but then you have to do it, and it has to be with such an emotion, an attention, attention, right? Not intention, that works too, but an emotion and attention so in other words, you have to be intensely attentive. I mean, really focused for you to lock it in for, for the listening, for the hearing to be the anchor. And what's much faster is for an action to become the anchor. And as soon as I can get you out doing it, then that anchors it, and from then on, now that's one more plug, one more step toward renewing the mind. And as we plug these things in, then they start creating a network in your neural pathways that actually cause these things to work together and you renew your mind so that you start thinking different, right? That's what the mind renewal program is going to be, is a faster way to do this. It's going to involve study, it's going to involve confession, it's going to involve m some memorization, really not much memorization. And, but beyond that, it's going to require action. And once you follow these steps, when you get done, your mind will be renewed in that department. Then we will move to the next department and we'll do the same thing. And then over a period, a fairly short period of time, especially compared to what you're used to, your mind will be renewed. And you watch when that happens, we will see a new breed of Christians rising up, walking normal as a Christian and doing the works of Jesus. And because of that, they will start to do the same works and greater because they're going to have a platform to launch from. Amen? So that's what we're working toward. Now, that's, again, that's in the future. I'm working on it. And it's not near as hard as it sounds, really. I mean, it's, it's really pretty amazing. Now, in, as you start to renew your mind, I mean, this is the key. And as, like I said, what got me onto that is the fact that you, right now, like I said, you already know it, and you're hearing it, sometimes for the first time. And as you hear it, it's going around in your short-term memory, kind of floating around there. And what's happening is, as you're hearing it, your mind is arguing with it in some cases. You know, maybe not a whole lot, but to some cases, it argues back and forth because it's trained another way. 
and you've been taught other stuff for a long period of time. But if you will stop and listen while, you're, while that unrenewed part of your mind is arguing against it, your spirit is going, that's right, that's right. There's a truth, there's a, there's a reality to it where you're saying, this is it, this is truth. And it starts to rise up, but that's because your spirit already knows this. And this is not new, it's not surprising, it's not some new, you know, as we say, fandangled type thing, you know. This is what God believes. This is what Jesus taught through Paul, who taught it to the churches. Now, the problem is the church has dropped the ball and has not passed it on the way it should have been, or we would be light years ahead of where we are today, right? Now, <clears throat> I had the pleasure the other day, there's a letter in the DHT manual that Dr. Lake wrote on April 22nd, 1911. And it was a letter to Carrie Judd Montgomery. If you've been to the DHT, you probably know what I'm talking about. If not, you can get the manual and look at it. But in the back, there's this letter. And in it, he talks about the secret of the aggressive ministry of healing that South Africa was witnessing. And he talked about his secret, how he basically trained his workers to get the results they got. And the funny thing is, the secret was very simple. A lot of it's what you're hearing right now. But, and just expanded upon but the main thing is, that secret was written in that letter, April 22nd, 1911, a hundred years ago. And the church still hasn't caught it. And the funny thing is, he says in there, there is this secret, this aspect, and he said that I believe that when the church gets it, that it will put the ministry of divine healing miles in advance of where it is now. And unfortunately, the church dropped the ball and didn't get it, and instead, he said, we don't beg God to come and heal like we used to. Instead, looking into his face, believing that he has given us the power of God, when he baptized us in the Holy Ghost, we command the devil and his works to depart. He said, that's the secret. That's it. He said, what, well, what else? There, no, that's it right there. See? And he said, and the amazing thing is, he said that that secret, when it was caught by the church, would put the ministry of healing miles in advance of where it was then. And if anything, the church has gone miles in retreat of where it was then. But that's changing. People are picking this up. People are grabbing this. People are starting to run with it. People are taking the chance to say, you know what? That's Bible. And they step out and they're seeing the results. And right now we're getting more healings than Dr. Lake ever saw. Where, where our success rate is higher. At the very highest, Dr. Lake saw 76% success rate. That was the highest he recorded. Now, he did see 100,000 healings in five years. Okay? That breaks down to about 20,000 healings per year, which breaks down to almost, it's probably about 15 to 1,800 per month. Right? So that's, that's a pretty good number. Right? Still more than the average church sees. But right now, because of the, you know, he only had 16 people to work with. Okay, we have trained thousands around the world, and we are seeing more healings every day than he saw in a year. Why? Because people are out there doing it. Now, I can't, we tried to keep up with them all in the beginning, and I can't do that anymore, but we are trying to work out a system where we can start keeping better records, but our success rate is higher, and our results are higher. We're getting more healings, the ministry is advancing, the teaching is advancing, the church is growing up, and everywhere, on every hand, the people are advancing and looking more like Jesus. Now, Ephesians 4 says that we're going to grow up to look like him, to grow up into him, actually is what it says. Now, if that's true, then every... Now, think about this. I'm going to give you a standard to judge things by. If the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to grow us up into Christ in all things, so that whenever they're done with us, we should look like Jesus. Is that right? Amen. We should walk in the stature and the measure of the stature of his fullness, right? Now, if that's true, then to do that, every teaching that you hear should make you look more like Jesus. Right? Not less like Jesus. So a way to judge the validity of a message, according to whether it's biblical or not, is did Jesus do this? Or is it easier than what Jesus did? Right? Not harder. Right? Because if, remember he said, it's either the same works and greater works. Now if we're going to do greater works, it's not going to be harder for us to do it. It's going to be easier for us to do it. Amen? If it's harder for us to do it, it wouldn't be a greater work. Amen? You get that? 
So we're going to just, so every teaching you hear should help you do the same works or greater works, meaning the same works but even easier, or even greater works in number and in, and in some cases even in size and, you know, import, if you want to call it that. So we need to realize everything you hear should make you look more like Jesus, not less like Jesus. Now, with that in mind, imagine for a second, open up a, you know, Charisma magazine or anything like that. We picked up a newspaper thing the other day and they had all these advertisements in it for conferences. Picture all these conferences. You can go in online, you can go anywhere and find them. There are conferences pretty much every week somewhere or something. Look at all those conferences. Look at what they're telling you they're going to teach you. Look at what they're going to be sharing and look what they're going to be doing. And then stop and think, can I really see Jesus doing that? Would Jesus himself do that? Would he have to do that to get power? Would he have to do this? Would he act this way? Would he do this thing? And if Jesus, now I'm not saying if Jesus never did it, we shouldn't do it per se, all right? Because there are some things, I mean, Jesus never sent out a prayer cloth. But the Spirit of God through Paul did. Okay? So I'm not saying just because Jesus never did a particular thing that we shouldn't do it. But I'm saying, what's the principle behind it? What are they doing that for? You have to realize, if what's going on at a conference, if it's by the Spirit of God, then there should be some results to it that actually ends up making you look like Jesus. Because remember, again, what is the pur what's the purpose of fivefold ministry? to grow us up into Jesus. What did Jesus say the Spirit was going to do? He didn't say, he said when he comes, he's not going to speak of himself. So that means the Spirit can't do or say anything that Jesus hasn't said or done. So he said he's going to bring to your remembrance everything I've said to you. So the Spirit is always going to go back to the Word. The Spirit's not going to go to some weird stuff, right? He's not going to have you doing stuff that are out there on the edge, you know what I'm saying? And again, I'm not against doing things different. I'm not talking about methods so much. I'm talking about what are the results. If you're going to use a method, the, the result should be Jesus. Right. right? It shouldn't be heathen paganism. Yeah. Right? And it, it, should, it surely shouldn't be like the prophets of Baal. Yeah. Right? And honestly, if you go to most conferences, that's what you see. You see people shout, dance, cry, do everything they can to get louder and louder to try to get God to come down. That's what the prophets of Baal did. Right. Right? And Elijah, the person with God, sat on the side and made fun of them. <laughs> right? Well, now that's not very Christian. Right? Well, he, he didn't have to be Christian. He wasn't. <laughs> right? But he just sat on the side and made fun of these people and said, why don't you scream louder? You know, maybe your God is uh, in the bathroom. Maybe he can't hear you. That's what he said. And he said, well, maybe your God's sleeping or maybe he's taking a vacation. Now, I mean, that's not very spiritual sounding. Is it? But he made fun of these people. And then when he got done, he said, okay, you guys, have had, you had your chance, now let me do my thing. And he said, watch, you did everything you could to make your God pour out fire. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to make it harder on my God. You notice that? He didn't make it easier. He didn't say, here, light up a bunch of, you know, torches and let's stick them near the ends of these altars and so that if God can send a good wind through here, he can start a fire. He didn't do that. He said, no, go get water. And then he said, pour it over the sacrifice, pour it over the altar, pour it in the ditches, go get more water. And he said, he kept saying, pour it. man, soak the wood, soak it down. Let's make it as hard on God as we can. And he said, now let's watch. And he called down fire and it, 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 it consumed everything. The altar, the wood, the sacrifice, every, even the water in the thing. Everything was gone. And see, the, what do we do is, in church? Oh, we're trying to create the atmosphere so that God can come down. No, go the other way. Go the, make it hard on God to show up. Because I've heard the stuff. Well, when the pattern is right, God will show up. The spirit, you know, make it. Somebody should have told Elijah that. You know, he didn't know that. He just made it hard on God. Let's make it harder on God to show up. Let's make it. So when he does show up, we know it's God. Yes. Amen? Because I don't know about you, I'd rather have nothing happen than have somebody try to work something up. Yeah. At least then you know nothing's happening. Right? But it's not a matter of trying to work stuff up. And, and the world can spot it. They, they can tell what you're doing. You know, they come in and see what you're doing, they laugh at you. But in the early days of the church, the world was afraid of the church. Why? Because the church wasn't hiding 
in a building and dancing and yelling and you know and all that kind of and on their face and crying out to God to do something he's already done they were afraid because the church was out there changing the world and turning the world upside down see but it's much more comfortable for us to be here it's more comfortable for us to be on our face down here because at least here if I'm on my face crying out somebody will see me and they'll say ooh isn't he spiritual but if we go out there and actually go to Walmart, guess what? We might actually have to interact with people that don't agree with us. You know, you might actually have to know your stuff. You might actually have to answer somebody. You know, and you don't want to feel stupid. Well, don't feel stupid. Learn. Know your stuff. Right? Joe witnesses do it. They can do it. You can do it. You got truth. Amen? That's, this is where we got to get to. Come on, this is... This isn't about how loud we can shout. How I always tell everybody, I don't care how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you land. You know, and that's been the problem. We have not had people walking straight when they land. Amen? It's getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Just kidding. Hey, I'm, I tell everybody I'm Methodist because I believe God has methods that he uses. Right? I'm Presbyterian because I believe there's a presbytery where that should lay hands and ordain people. And I'm, I'm Catholic because I believe there's a universal church that, that people are either in or they're not in. I'm Baptist because I definitely believe in baptism. Right? I'm Pentecostal because I do believe in the gifts and I believe what happened on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> I'm Episcopal because there is an eldership. So, I mean, come on, I can fit in with anybody. Right? I mean, I, 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 technically I could even say I'm a Jehovah's Witness because I do witness for God. Right? I, I think it's a ripoff that they get to use the term Kingdom Hall. I think, we, you know, that's a good name. Okay? Especially if you're going to preach the Kingdom of God. You ought to be able to call it Kingdom Hall. Maybe if we put a sign up that said Kingdom Hall, we might have some of them show up. Right? And they get to preach to them. Amen? Who knows? I mean, all the cults have all the good names anyway. Christian Science, that's a great name. You know? Looking at things from the Bible from a scientific aspect, that's wonderful. Now, you know, they're crazy, but still. You know, they got a good name, right? They got all these things. Probably the best name I like is Salvation Army. Now, they're not a cult. They're, they're good, right? They're solid. At least they were when William Booth started them. They've kind of veered off, but they got good basis anyway. But, man, that's a good name. Salvation Army? Whew, man. You know, I, if, has, how many of y'all, how many of y'all been to the DHT? Okay, remember me telling you about how I can trace John Lake or every revival back to John Lake? Basically, because he, like down in um, Valparaiso, Chile, remember the guy down there, Willis Hoover? He was a Methodist missionary. And he went down there and he wrote John Lake and said, what's this thing I'm hearing about the baptism in the Spirit? And John Lake wrote him back and said, here's what you do. And he got filled with the Spirit. And then they kicked him out of the Methodist church. And he went across the street and started the Pentecostal Methodist church. And I read that the other day. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, you know, I really like the name Salvation Army. Maybe we could start a Pentecostal Salvation Army. <laughs> just get, just right over across the street. Because you know? they, they had it together in the early... I have a set of books on the Salvation Army. It's a, a seven-volume thing. I'm telling you, I read that thing, I get so fired up. Just how they talk about how they organized and how they started their training corps and, and how they started their... It's amazing. I'm telling you, if the church... One day I was talking... <laughs> well, you'd call it praying. But I was talking to God. Okay? And I was... Going and I said, God, I don't get it. I'm preaching this. I'm saying this. For some reason, I don't think they're getting it. How, how do I get them to see what I see? And the answer was just so quick and so easy. He said, get them to read what you've been reading. I was like, okay. And all of a sudden, my book purchase you know, expense went up. Because instead of buying one book, I had to buy five, six, ten you know, of these things. And I started gathering all these things and reading them. And I started making everybody read them. And I started passing them on. I'm like, okay, they've got to read this. But I only got one copy of the Salvation Army book. So I can't find the other one yet or I can't find the, you know, another set. Uh, I'm not letting that go yet. So the closest I can come is read it to them. Because you know, they're not getting it. Because so, it's a prized possession for mine. But just if the church ever gets a hold of that. Man, we, what has happened to us? What, what's wrong with us that in the early days of Pentecost, these people would get the baptism of the Spirit. Man, they'd get up and go. And now we get the baptism of the Spirit, and it's just, oh, well, you know, yeah, that's neat. And, and honestly, I think half the time they don't even get the real baptism of the Spirit. Amen. You know, it, because if the real baptism caused them to do that, why didn't it cause us to do that? You see? So there has to be something there. And 
I read books. There's a book called uh, Movements That Changed the World. Awesome, awesome book. And it's talking about planting, uh, church planting movements. And then <clears throat> there's all these just different books that just go into the history of some of these things. And William Booth, he wasn't spirit-filled. He wasn't, you know, Pentecostal by any stretch. His wife passed away due to breast cancer. A horrible death. It was long and drawn out. It was awful. But they didn't have that light, that understanding. But when that man died, he had 17,000 ordained ministers that were in every nation in the world just about planting these cores. And I'm telling you, they would go out, they, and you know, they didn't come to churches and sit here and go, hey, come to my church. They would find the bars and go stand outside sometimes, sometimes even go inside. But many times they would stand outside and just say, well, as they would come out, they'd tell them, you know you're on your way to hell. You want to get saved. You need to get saved. You need Jesus. And they would get these drunks and say, okay, just, just kneel right here on the ground, right here, in, right in front of the bar. And if the drunk knelt, they knelt. And many times they even knelt down first and said, here, get down here with me. Let's pray. Right then, bam. And they would get down and they would pray and get these people right then. And many times these drunks would sober up instantly by the power of God. And then they would take them. And, they, and the funny thing, they would go to the prostitution houses and stand out front and win these women to God. And they would take them to their dormitories. And in two weeks, they would have them so thoroughly converted and so thoroughly changed that within two weeks, those same women who used to be working in the brothels and the prostitution houses, they would have them back out in front of the same place, witnessing to the women they used to know and telling them, look what God has done to me and changing their lives. Now, what do we do? Oh, stay away. You'll, you'll slide back in. Stay away from that because, you know, you'll go right back to what you used to do. Because there's something they had that the church isn't preaching if, when if we work more out of fear, and the only way we stay out of sin is staying totally away from it. And if you stay totally away from it, that's what's made the church a subculture that is almost totally irrelevant. Why? Because we don't interact with society anymore. We don't go out and witness to them anymore. Why? Because we're afraid to get near them. Because we're afraid. See, we're more afraid of their sin kind of coming off onto us rather than we are confident that our God can overpower their sin. See, we're more afraid of being infected by them than we are afraid of them being infect, infected by us. I could, I could go on and on about this because there is this aspect that the church has to get back to where we were even then and even beyond that. But there has to be this in us where we're not afraid of this stuff and we're willing to go in. William Booth took his eight-year-old son at one time, eight years old, took him into a bar in England. Now, bars back then was rough. And he took him in, and it was hard, because I mean, bars were basically brothels themselves back then. And he took him in, and all this stuff's going on. And he takes his son, walks in there and says, look, look here. And his name was uh, Bramwell. He said, Bramwell, look, look right here. See these people? He looked at him and he said, yes, Papa. He said, these are our people. This is our congregation. These are the people Jesus sent us to. Never forget these people. Win these people. And he, he used to teach his people, go for the lost, and go for the worst. Because if you can go into town and win the worst person over, the word will spread and you'll win half of the others also. But what do we do? We stay away from what? Well, they may be able to out-argue us. They may be able to out-debate us. And we have to realize, you know, even uh, I do teaching on the anointing, which is, if you haven't heard it, it's quite different, <laughs> as you might guess, from other teachings you've heard on the anointing. But I can take you through Scripture. And it's so funny because... In the church, you hear about, oh, don't touch this. Don't touch God's glory. Don't touch this. If you touch that, you'll defile it. You know, or if a sinner touches you, he can defile you and all this kind of stuff. We always hear, and we're so afraid of getting defiled. And yet, you go back and study the anointing. I challenge you. Take your concordance. Look up the word anointing or anoint. Right? Actually, anoint is what you want to look up. Look up the word anoint and look up the word altar. And then find the scripture that talks about anoint the altar. And if you look that up, you know what it'll tell you? It'll say, well, once you anoint the altar, that anything that touches the altar, it becomes anointed. That's right. oh. it's, you know, come on, in the church, we think of it opposite. We think, well, once the, the altar is anointed, don't touch it because you'll defile it. No, when you touch it, you were anointed. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Now think about it. Isn't that the opposite of what the church, yeah. the idea the church has given us? But that's what the Bible says. 
And yet that's, it's for, that's why when the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she didn't have to worry about her defiling him. Right? He anointed her. Why? Because power went into her. Do you realize her sin? I mean, the Bible is very clear. She came with an issue of blood. Go back and read Leviticus. If she came into a crowd, that was worthy of stoning. She could have been stoned for just being in the crowd. And she comes up and touches a rabbi's garment? Man, see, we don't have any, any conception of that because we don't understand stonings and the law. And yet, people want to go back into the law? You sure? Think about it. And so, whenever she did that, and, and all of a sudden it said the, the, the fount of her blood was dried up and she knew within herself that she was healed. It's amazing. What happened? The anointing, the power of God, healed her. Amen. She didn't defile him. He anointed her without him even knowing it. Amen? Do you see how big God is? That's who lives in you. That's who lives in you. you you're not going to get defiled by the outside coming. It's not... <laughs> It's not what goes in a man that defiles him. It's not what goes on a man that defiles him. It's not what touches a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him. Amen? That's, right. that's the key. And the problem is, if that's true, then many of you are already defiled. Because people say, well, I don't say anything bad. I don't cuss. I don't Let me tell you, I don't like cussing. I hate cussing. I've never been a big cusser. Even, you know, but in my unsaved days, I didn't like it. All right? But I would rather hear somebody cuss than hear somebody say, God took my baby. Or God put this cancer on me. Why? Because that's worse. Right? Because the Bible didn't say a whole lot about cussing and about Jesus taking your cussing, but he did take your sickness. Amen? And he says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth except that which is, or, or only let what is edifying come out. And so right there we ought to realize what is corrupt, anything that is leading toward degeneration or leading toward anything that's vain, Anything that doesn't produce. We ought to think. Speak things you want. You know, speak, it, speak right. Speak life. Speak the words of Jesus. Let, and when you do that, your words become spirit and life. Isn't that amazing? That's who lives in you. Whenever you speak those things, the, the Spirit of God is trying to get out of you. There's, there's about three or four different ways that He can get out of you. One is by the laying on of hands. Right? And that's the least lowest way to do it. That is not the way... Really, you want to do it. But you, and the only reason they have it in Mark 16 is so that that's a sign. When you lay hands on someone and they get healed, that's a sign. They know this is when it happened, and you're saying it's in the name of Jesus, so they can say this is a sign, Jesus did this. Right? But, that, but the reason it's so low level is because you have to be there. You can't help somebody across town. You have to be there. So then the next, after that, is through uh, like a, what we call prayer cloth. You look at prayer cloth in the concordance, you won't find it. That's a term we use. It said that they took cloths and aprons off of Paul's body. It, it wasn't special prayers. He, it didn't even say he ever prayed. Yeah, I would be surprised if he prayed. It said they took cloths off him, aprons, and they sent them out. And wherever that cloth went, they were healed, or wherever that cloth went, they were delivered. It didn't say anything about prayer. We call it that. But if, if you come up and said, hey, can you get me a prayer cloth, you know, and I you know, ripped a sleeve off of my shirt and gave it to you, You'd still look at it and go, okay, can you, are you going to pray over it? That's why, because we're hung up on the religion. We're hung up on that, that aspect. It's not about the praying, it's about the life. And those claws, because they'd been on Paul's body, were impregnated with the life of God. And the beauty of that is, whenever you put that cloth near somebody that's sick, it repels it like magnets. You know? You, 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 know, you can turn them one way and they'll stick, and turn them the other way and they'll repel. And that's the way it is. You put life near death, death flees. Amen? That's what you've got to realize. That's who's in you. So whenever you start living like this, everything starts to change. And that's why he, when he sent those claws out, like I said, it wasn't prayer claws. It was just clothing off of his body. And so if, if you get a hold of this, everything starts to change. I remember I did it at a Assembly God church I was going to. We just started that church, or some other people did, and we just got there. And I went in and started praying over the chairs. We were going to uh, pray for some... Uh, or ordain elders in that church that night. And I just prayed over the chairs they were going to be sitting in. Laid hands on them, on the chairs. And then the guys come in a little bit later on, they all sit in the chair. Within about 30 minutes of the service starting, every one of them were on their knees, on their face, before God. Most of them were crying and repenting. See, what? Life. You get life. Life drives out darkness. 
Life drives out death. God is light. He is life. He is life. I mean, He is love. I should say that. He is light, life, and love. That's who you are. If God is light, He's life, and He's love, you're light, life, and love. You look in the Bible, that's what it says you are. And so we have to realize if that's who He is, then that's what should be emanating from us. Yeah. We should be emanating life. I went through a... What was it? I was at a... Well, believe it or not. Where do you think I was? Walmart. I was at a Walmart, of course. Well, I was at a Walmart one night. <laughs> and I'll never forget it because it's when it's something clicked in me and I realized that's... And it took me right back to Scripture. There was this lady... I was heading toward the checkout stand, and this lady was going this way. And she went that way, and she was a good 10, 15 foot past before I crossed her path. And whenever I crossed her path where she had gone, wow, perfume, right? I mean, she was leaving a trail of perfume, right? And it was funny because I could step out of it. I could step back in it. It hung there. And immediately, I remembered the scripture. That everywhere we go, we're to, to bring the sweet-smelling savor of Jesus Christ. And I thought, imagine if I could start recognizing Christ in me. And that everywhere I go, I don't see it, but everywhere I go, I leave this vapor trail. And somebody, then somebody's walking along with a cane, and I walk past, and they walk through my vapor trail, and all of a sudden, they get healed. Yeah. Now, isn't that kind of like what Peter did with his shadow? Wouldn't that be a greater work? You know, I ain't never heard anything like that. Great, it's a greater work. Wonderful. Right? Well, I wonder why that would happen. Well, that would happen because it's a wonder and it makes you wonder. That's why it would happen. Right? You say, well, but how would they know who healed them? Who cares? They're healed. Amen? Now, if I walk past and they walk past and somebody drops his cane and goes, glory to God, I'm healed. How many of you know? I'm probably going to go, let me explain how that happened. Amen? But that's who you are. That's who lives in you. Now, I'd mentioned one way of laying hands on a sick. I'd mentioned another way of uh, prayer cloth or what we call prayer cloths and clothing going off to people. But then you can also <clears throat> transmit the power and the life of God in a word. We see that all the time. Jesus gave a command, said something. You can tell. And I'll, I'll let you know this right now. No is almost always more anointed than yes. Right? Almost every time. Somebody presses you and says, hey, you want to do this? Let's do this. You want to do this? Let's do it now. If somebody tries to press me, my, my initial reaction is no. Why? Because you can never, you will almost always make a mistake by moving too fast, but you'll almost never make a mistake by moving too slow. And if somebody's trying to push you, the devil always tries to drive you. Right? And he'll try to make you move too quick and make a mistake. Now, I believe in moving quick. I believe in obeying the Bible. But if somebody's pressing you for an answer right then, just say no. You want an answer? No. The answer is no. Right? Give me 10 minutes, come back, and we'll talk about it. But I, I, that's what I, you know, I, I'm pretty bad about not saying no to people, you know, when it comes to going places and pray, but I'm learning. And so, now, that's another way, is saying a word, a command. But then there's another way, the fourth way, basically, is with a look. With a look. Now, think about this. You can transmit the Spirit of God with a look. Now, how many of you know that's true? Amen? How many of you have had kids? Now, you know, you, you can give that child a look, and they know exactly what you mean. Isn't that right? I know whenever we were going to a church, we'd go in, and we'd be sitting there, and whenever I went in, it was me and my wife and my three kids, and then we'd ha usually have another six or seven kids with us that were their friends, and everywhere we went was this big entourage, you know, because they always had friends, and we'd go in, and we'd get, and I'd tell them, you're going to be friends with my kids, you're going to go to church. So, you know, if you're going to spend the night on Saturday night, guess what? You're going to go to church Sunday morning. And so they would have to bring their church clothes if they had them or whatever, and they would we'd take them to church. And I usually sit on the back row because I like sitting back there anyway. But we'd sit back there with this whole, we'd take up a pew or two, of, you know, with all these kids. And it was funny because I always carried this black bag, and the kids knew it. And I'd sit down, and if they started preaching garbage, my kids, I mean, my kids knew it was garbage. They would know it as quick as I would. And they would be looking at me and be looking around, what's dad doing? What's dad doing? You know, and, there, and I think they actually took bets on how long I would sit there. You know? Okay, I, I, he, he'll be out of here in 10 minutes. You watch. We'll be out of here. He's not going to listen to this. I know. And then we'd go back and forth. And I'd sit there, and finally I would, I'd reach down and grab my bag, and they would go, oh, we're out of here. We're, we're leaving. Dad's got his bag. We're leaving. And I, I would look down, and I'd go, right, up and out. And so then they would all get up. And it was kind of funny. We tr you know, you try to be nonchalant, 
But when you got like two pews of people that get up at the same time, it's like, and you hear everybody going, it's kind of hard to be nonchalant. And I didn't want them to slip out one at a time. You know, I'd always tell my wife, you wait, I'll go out first, then you send them out, that way I can corral them. And then you bring it, when you come out, I know that's all of them. <laughs> you know, you have to plan ahead if you got kids. And so, but we'd go from, you know, to church like that. But we, I could look at them, I can give them a look. So spirit can be transmitted by look. You look in the Bible, it's in the Bible. So there are all these aspects of different ways. It doesn't have to be a certain method. The Spirit of God follows your intention. He will follow your intention. Now, it, your intention should be along the lines of the will of God, obviously, but what you intend to happen is what will happen, not necessarily what you always say. Unless you only believe that only what you say exactly the way you say it is what will happen. See, you set the rules. God hasn't set the rules. You've set them. And you decide if he'll use you, how he'll use you, or if he won't use you. You've decided that. So the key is to, to know that God is big enough that if you can give a look, and it can set somebody free. You can lay hands and set somebody free. You can throw cloth on somebody and they'll set them free. So I'm, I'm trying to get you to move into the things of the Spirit that are biblical and not weird, but yet at the same time they are effective. Amen? Now, where are we at time-wise? Oh, you got to go to break. Go to break. There we go. <laughs>